So let, let's take one uh, step further. And you describe four techniques or four methods or ways in which talking about success, describing process, progress takes place. So maybe explain to us very briefly the first one. Um, the first technique we described is um, we label it ascending periodization. I mentioned it already before. It's actually that you you label, um, you, you, you cut the time axis um, of the development of international law into several pieces. And usually you give the, the, the most recent one, the most favorable name. Yeah, it's the period of modern international law or can, let's say- Can you give us a concrete example of- a, a, a classical example is the distinction between modern and classical international law, or let's say some people who speak of the uh, the most uh, recent period since uh, 1989 as the period of global constitutionalization, um, which is a very favorable name, and before a um, period of cooperation or of a divided world or whatever. So it's, it's about labeling. Um, so like international law being a system of coordination and exactly. moving to community exactly. or yeah. those kind. It's, it's a very good example. The, the, the stage is uh, international law, a law of um, um, coordination, of cooperation, or international law as a blueprint of social life. Um, also, this is an, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an ascending periodization, which gives the reader the impression that uh, we are talking about a story of success. It's a, it's, a, it's a method to create such an atmosphere. Your impression from reading that literature, what's the level of self-awareness of the authors that they're telling a story of success, that they're telling a story of progress? Is it, in their eyes, do you get the impression that they just think of themselves as being analytical and dispassionate, but it just turns out like that way? Or do you think there's a self-consciousness of Maybe sort of both. So sometimes we really had the impression that uh, it was it is not clear to uh, some of the authors that they're actually working on a progress story, um, um, and that was part of our ambition to write the article to actually raise the awareness that what what is the discourse doing when it does what it does. So are we to expect now that we publish your piece in Ejo <coughs> that we will suddenly see? a slew of submissions no, which I, will tell a story of regress and decay and, you know, Spengler will be a back in fashion and... No, uh, no, probably only the, the point that we, we recognize that we cannot evade pro, the progress, uh, telling the progress stories. I think that's, that, that's one point of the article. We, if we want to be part of the discipline, we have to engage with progress narratives. Um, we cannot evade it. We cannot sometimes evade using progress vocabulary. And actually, we would admit ourselves that we are using progressive vocabulary to make, to give names to things that would otherwise not, be, not have a name. For example? Uh, for example, one example for me is international legislation. Um, is there such, such a thing as international legislation? Some would contest this, but still, if you don't... Uh, if you, don't, if you don't use this vocabulary, international legislation, some developments may be out of your focus. Global administrative law might be put in the same category of global constitutionalism, etc. <clears throat> also, it's a story of progress in the way you see it. So what's your second technique? Um. Yeah, our second technique is detection of trends. So uh, some people write in their article that there is this trend towards judicialization of dispute settlement. And um, these trends are depicted in a, in a favorable manner. So trends are associated with um, a progressive development. Um, so detection of trends is actually the, the second technique. And you're also comfortable, because detection of trends in theory could go also the other direction. I'm a sort of pessimist, so I've written recently of mm. uh, a negative trend, uh, both in the mm. European Union and in public international law, mm. etc. But for you, when 
again, as an empirical proposition, when there's detection of trends, they tend to be progressive trends. Very often this is the case, and it's a somewhat um, less ambitious way of telling a progress story. This is an interesting thing. Po possibly people want to avoid a clear and st strong, hard claim uh, of a progress story, but nevertheless they, w they do not want to, um, um, to give up um, the, the atmosphere um, of working on a progress story, so they use this uh, vocabulary of future studies and then they, they say, yeah, here we have a, this is an indication of, of a new trend that they are trying to take the events or developments more in the present in order to tell a story about the future. So. I get And then the third one is proving increased value yeah. orientation of international law. Yeah. So if I understand it correctly, there's a story before international law were uh, rules of the road, you drive on the left side or you drive on the right side in order to minimize friction, etc. But now there's increased international legal normativity, which is value laden, yeah. etc. And why is that considered progress in your view? Well, actually, there is a lot of authors who are telling us since um, several decades that there is, there are um, international law becomes more value-based in a sense, uh, for example, that the, 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 there is a stronger community, there are indications that there is more a sense of community in international law or um, that, that human rights play a much more uh, important role and uh, the ban on the use of force is also um, value-based, whereas in earlier periods there was more neutral international law. This is part of the... So, I want to ask you a delicate question, because I think it's a question you very carefully avoid from dealing with, but again, it's, I think, one of the questions which any reader of the article, especially when it comes to this third criteria, I think it's actually the second one in the order of your article, on increased value content of international law. Is there an ideological bias there, that the values would be more center-left than center-right, and that the more international law in the international legal scholarship, in other words, goes in that direction, that's considered progress. I, I, I'm not, I'm just asking you if that's part of your finding because you don't speak about the content of the value, increased value discourse, and I want to put that on the table because when we speak about values, we're speaking also about ideological orientation. So would you say that progress is considered a move from right to left in the scholarship no. you've reviewed? You want to say something? Um, it's not a dangerous question no. or a provocative no. question. It's really... A... No, to, in our mind, human rights are... Uh, they are open to interpretation, of course, and um, uh, we see that both left and right appeal to human rights, so um, we try to be... Although in different orientation. In different orientation, but you can make a, a rightist progress story also by appealing to human rights. Um, if you, for example... So what other property. fields do you see more value orientation apart from human rights? Uh, Human rights, indeed, is something that everybody now subscribes to, so it's lost a little bit of its uh, mm -hmm. uh, right-left orientation. But are there, where, where else do you see increased value discourse? I mean, you can find it in, in many fields, international environmental law, um, international humanitarian law. Um, you can find more value-based rules. And there do you not find, is there any ideological bias there? Um, Actually, this was not the question we were interested in. We were, we were, just, just, we were just interested in, the, in the, the way the story is created. I but I see, of course... I understand. Uh, I understand yeah. that this is not a critique of how you wrote your article. Well, you I'm you fine with critique. You're so. describing, but I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm putting myself in the shoes of the reader, and mm -hmm. you will have many readers of this article, and I'm trying to ask you some of the question. Imagine you were giving a paper. So somebody would ask you, did you also detect a certain ideological bias in what is defined as progress and as success? And maybe you'll say we didn't or we didn't look closely enough, but it's, I'm just interested in... Mm -hmm. 
Well, there is a spin to progress. I would, and I would what agree. is the spin to progress? Um, well, as we see it, the modern conception of progress that is still prevailing in international law comes from the Enlightenment era. And if you, if you want, uh, everything that we are saying is still impregnated um, with that type of spirit. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's the spin. Although that's, there's a little bit of irony in that, isn't there? Because on the one hand, you're arguing that there's a story of progress. The further we go, the better we become. And yet at the same time, we hearken back to the enlightenment and we hearken back to etc. in looking for our values. There's a nice irony there. Uh, Is it irony, really? We, yeah. Pardon? Is it irony, really? Is Do you think it's irony? Well, it's a, it's a little bit but ironical we, in the way you present your paper. But, but we Bec could look at it from a different perspective and uh -huh. say it's a, it's a slow and gradual realization of um, universal values. So we are values. finally the real realizers of the yeah. Enlightenment project. It's discussable, of yes. course, no, no. But, but that's the way you could, you could um, perceive the, the whole development. And the last technique that you describe is very interesting. It's the paradigm shift. So you say, now there's a great investment in scholarship to be able to write an article where either you shift the paradigm mm -hmm. or where you define paradigm shifts, etc. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting that you claim that this is a proxy for success or for progress narrative, correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think this is, um, actually it's, it's a very banal operation, um, to be honest, actually. You, um, it's, um, it's a method which is somewhat similar to the periodization technique, but which is a bit more subtle. You take two paradigms and, and you give the more successful, the more favorable lab label, yeah? the, more, the, the label which sounds more progressive. Yeah? For example, you tell, as I mentioned before, the story of from particleism to universalism, yeah? from the old order to a new order. And, and by, just by, by choosing such a setting of a story. And but is paradigm shift conceptually different then from detecting trends or periodization? Is it not just the same kind of thing with a slightly different nomenclature? Because you're describing there was X and now there's Y, and Y is better than X. So for one, it's a trend. For another one, it's a period. And for a third person, it's a new paradigm. But it's in some ways, is it the same phenomenon just with slightly different nomenclature or is it a genuinely different type of phenomenon, different type of technique? It's a bit more flexible. The, the paradigm a, shift. The paradigm shift um, technique is a bit more flexible than the other ones because you, can, uh, you have more room for ambivalences. Yeah. That's counterintuitive to me, because I would think that to detect a trend would be easier, to periodize would be easier. If we take paradigm in a very strict sense, mm -hmm. you know, in a, then it's, it's, a lot has to go in to show that the yeah. paradigm has really shifted. Yeah. But that's not the way the, uh, the notion paradigm is used in, in, in social used sciences. Bit, it's yeah. used a bit yeah. loosely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's but in because a very... there's a... There's so yeah. much payoff to be yeah. able to either shift the paradigm yeah. yourself or yeah. to break the yeah. paradigm, yeah. right? It, I often it, think... It's, it's also the appeal of the notion paradigm, because if yeah. you want, to, if you want to, to work on a, on a narrative of progress, then, it's, then it's, uh, it supports your, um, your ambition to use such a strong notion such as paradigm. And it's more so, subtle. It's more yeah. subtle if you talk about coexistence as a paradigm to uh, view international law uh, as opposed to uh, cooperation. Then this is uh, a more more subtle way of describing uh, uh, describing it. That, I, as I say, that I'm not sure. I'm not 100% convinced whether the three techniques are people situated in slightly different cultures with slightly different vocabularies doing the same thing or they are truly discrete, but it doesn't matter because it's true that sometimes this kind of story of progress you present is presented as a paradigm shift, as a new trend, as a different period. 
but at the end of the day. So you, you move in your article, and then as you move towards the end of the article, you talk about some strategic assumptions that sort of undergrid the phenomenon. Explain to us what you mean by strategic assumption. What are the strategic assumptions here? So the strategic assumptions are our answer to the question, when is, when is a progress argument actually successful? So we are saying they're not successful because they employ the technique of paradigm shifts. That's not why we, we would necessarily buy that there is progress. But they are successful because they dwell on or employ or have in the background these assumptions that we, we, we list. Uh, the opposition of law and violence. That's, I think, a very strong assumptions, uh, assumption that we make in a lot of progress arguments. And these are not necessarily made ex explicit, but they are some kind of world knowledge. So, Do you want to walk us through some of these assumptions, some are like law, the opposition <coughs> of law and violence? And mm -hmm. well, uh, May I add something? Yes, of course. Um, I would like to say it's very important to say that um, the techniques to create um, stories of progress, um, they use the credit of the strategic assumption. So the success of the techniques um, is um, at least partly due to the, the prima facie plausibility of these strategic assumptions. As Tillman mentioned, uh, the, that law is the opposition of violence, right. which is so very, very important. Predominance of positive forces yeah. in history, yeah. rationality through institutionalization, mm -hmm. progressive language contributes to progressive mm -hmm. praxis. Mm -hmm. So you say, this is the kind of assumptions, not of the writers, assumptions of the field that make this kind of writing successful? Or is this an assumption that the progress narr narrators and the success narrators implicitly have in their paper? It's, there's a difference. One is to say that's a capital that exists in the field which you're exploiting. The other is that it's inbuilt into your narrative, but not necessarily a shared capital. I would say it's a sort of general world knowledge which is available and can be used in order to make a progress narrative plausible. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily universal, so I wouldn't say it's really built in. Um, but it has proven uh, operative and successful in the past, and that's why people make use of it. And yet, part of the argument is that very often it's implicit use of it. It's not, it's almost subconscious. These are unstated assumptions mm -hmm. that operate to explain why uh, progress narration and success narration uh, are successful. Mm -hmm. And the measure of success is what? That they become the prevalent view, that they get published more, that better careers. What's the measure of success? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Actually, you could make an empirical analysis out of this and it would be interesting um, to analyze AGL uh, articles and test them on, on this, especially if they make use of these assumptions and get published. It would be interesting to know. It would, and, but that would not only show the bias of the authors of the article, but also of the editorial process of EGIL. So, But you must, since you're claiming that they are successful, you must have had some implicit criteria of success, so what, or explicit. So what would be your criteria of success? It's, is it doctrinal success, that it becomes la doctrine, or is it career success, or...? Mm. I would probably put it a bit more careful. I would just say the strategic assumption, they support the plausibility of the claim which is made by the use of a certain technique. They support it. They are sort of basis, yeah, which, is, um, yeah, which supports it. I'm, I would be careful to say that it is um, a sort of guarantee for success. It's, it's no, more careful. No, yeah. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't like to suggest that that's what yeah. you say, yeah. but nonetheless, you're saying a little bit more that they make these arguments plausible. Mm -hmm. You're saying, and this is why uh, progress narration and success narration become successful, become dominant, etc. Mm -hmm. And I just want to flesh out a little bit more what, it, what are your criteria. 
to, to say that because it's a little bit more than simply saying they make them more plausible. You, it's part of the apparatus that gives them sort of credibility, etc. And so what are the criteria to say indeed? Is it, is it a sociological criteria of scholars in the field or is it an in-field sort of looking at la doctrine and yes. what are the prevailing views mm -hmm. and we see that these kind of views have become it's on the whole i would say it's it's acceptability in the community of scholars on the whole measured yeah. by um we, we didn't do I'm quantitative not asking research for a quanti but quantification yeah. no, no, but you but had an intuition what was your intuition that was our impression yeah but yeah. as measured by the success of those scholars or the success of those views in becoming mainstream? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah means the, one the, or the, the other or both. The, the likelihood that such um, stories become part of, of a, a mainstream narrative. Yeah. I see. So, you, you are very careful to say, and you have explained it again today, and I think that's... Uh, it's totally appropriate that you were trying to analyze and explain a certain f phenomenon. It's not, you don't write directly about progress, you write about the writing about progress, etc. Uh, but, and you are very non-normative. But now I invite you to be a little bit normative. So, there's a hint of that in the paper, that you are not always convinced that the reality uh, is totally in sync with the progress narrative or the success narration. So there's a little bit of critical sentiment creeps into your article. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're trying to say there's something else going on. Uh, so I want, you, I want to tease out from you a little bit more on that. Because there's a kind of normative touch to it. One can mm -hmm. feel that you're not simply describing, but there's some little bit of critical view there. Can you, can you talk to that? So it's, the question I think is, what is the object of progress? Um, where do you look for progress? Do you have an empirical notion of progress? Do you look to the world as it is maybe? Um, and try to find out progress, or is it, is it something different? Um, is it an, are you clear that it's an evaluation? And they are not always parallel. So um, what we find interesting is that even though the world is not perfect, and even though we, we see a lot of um, developments to the worst maybe, the general tone of our discourse still, in our view, is a progressive discourse. And there's a, a discontinuity here. And a discontinuity between what and what? Uh, between the um, empirical, between empirical developments, and um, and the scholarly discourse. I think you observed that um, um, correctly. That there is probably some distance um, between our view and this very optimistic. Um, progress narratives. We say that it's, it's unavoidable to treat or to, to deal with the question of progress, but uh, we indeed, we discovered um, less interest of the discipline in counter-arguments. Yeah. So counter what, what would speak um, against the telling of a, of a story of success? Um, and I think this is also probably one of the reasons why our discipline, um, which tells a lot of stories of, of success, um, is, somewhat, uh, is often perceived in a somewhat um, critical way from the outside also. So, yeah, the international lawyers, they live a bit in their own world. Okay, so now let me sort of, again, it's not playing the devil's advocate, but trying to think of what might be some reaction and some of the pushback that, because I think we've covered the thesis as a whole, haven't we? We sort of worked through the basic assumption, the motivation mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. 
a methodological tool used, then the techniques, strategic assumptions, and even at the end we teased out some normativity. So one push is that your story is based on what you're looking at. So you look at global constitutionalism, you're invited to a conference on global constitutionalism, and suddenly you have this insight. Why is everybody interested in global constitutionalism? And you, your insight is because they're interested in progress. And this is a story of progress. But if you were invited not to a conference on global constitutionalism, but on globalization, it would be the opposite. There, the mood and the writing has been critical. Globalization has been disastrous. It has increased, increased inequalities in the world. The law is serving capital and is not serving social well. It's, so it's just, you happen to go to global constitutionalism, which is a story of success. If you were invited a day before, a day after, to a conference on globalization rather than global constitutionalism, you would say, oh my, 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 international law is very critical, the developments are very critical, it's not progress, it's regress, it's the winning of capital over social values. Is there some arbitrariness? The accident that you went to global constitutionalism and not to globalization? No. I don't think so, no. Um, um, of course you can find examples um, where you have a very critical general attitude, but, but we were interested on the overall atmosphere in the discipline and in the sometimes subtle and sometimes strong pressure to tell um, a progress narrative. And, and so, to, to be but less what I'm trying to say is that when you say the general field, it, could it be that the contours of the general field are, have a lot to do with use of force in human rights? But if, for example, mm -hmm. you looked at international economic law, at international investment law. But, but you would there, have very, very different narratives. Yeah, but even there, even in international economic law, you could tell a story of, of um, um, ongoing institutionalization and uh, development of uh, but it's uh, the also WTO. A, uh, but it's also very critical literature. Also, also critical, of course, but, but in, in, I, I in the say long... That the, I wouldn't the, say that the literature on investment or economic globalization is a story is predominantly a narrative of progress and success. I would say, at best, it's a very mixed bag. Yeah, but in the long run, in the long run, if you look at it from, Arguably. let's say, in the, in the, the perspective of the If the, the progress last, means legalization, then yeah, I... Yeah, last 70 years, the contribution of international economics law to maintenance of peace, yes. for example, also, it's, 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 it's possible, and, and the overall merit of the whole field not, I mean, this literature on investment is, is, is very specific and it's, it's also very um, it's focused on, on the contemporary question, but in the, in the long run, it's, um, it, it's not a question of, uh, it's not a story of failure, I think. It's also not described as that, even if there are very critical voices. So. Uh, let's uh, bring it to an end. I think it's very interesting and I think a lot of people will now be, I hope, enticed to go and actually read your article with care. So a kind of last question. So what would you like the readers to take out of this article? I mean, apart from saying this is interesting, this is not writing about progress, this is writing about writing about progress and it's analytical and the mechanisms are described. And, but is there, what would you like the reader to take out of this? What well, kind of reaction would you expect to create? Well, we hope that we raise the awareness what's, what's going on when people make progress arguments. We, we actually give people um, um, uh, names for what is going on. We, 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 we tell them that, well, hey, this is a progress argument, you should be careful, you should be extra careful maybe. Um, so don't get fooled is probably... But would the reaction, I mean, would you want them to be careful or wouldn't it just... Why would you want them to be careful if if there's a narrator, if the narration of success and progress is, couldn't it just lead so people will mask it a little bit more effectively? No, what we're saying is that progress is never neutral. So there are strong value assumptions in the background and it cannot be taken for granted that everybody shares these assumptions, even though we 
consider them widely shared, but you, you that there, we, we point out in the paper that there are, there are possibilities to challenge these assumptions, and that should be consciously made. I would say there, there may be strong reason to work on a, um, on a progress narrative as an international legal scholar, but we want the international legal scholar to do it consciously in if he or she is doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations for a very interesting article. Thank you. Thank you very much.